All right, welcome to the last podcast for the Newton's Laws unit, where today we're going to be talking about friction, which is all about Newton's third law. So remember that little lab we did at the beginning of the year, or just picture a book sliding across the table. So why do you think that book will not continue to move at a constant velocity forever? If you said friction, you'd be correct. If the sliding book slows down, what's the force responsible? If you said friction again, give yourself a pat on the back. So how can I keep it moving at a constant velocity? Is the answer friction again? Nope, got to have a net force of zero. And do I need to apply a force to keep it moving and why? Nope, inertia keeps the object moving. So if you can have a net force of zero, all you need is that inertia to keep it moving because inertia things want to stay in motion because of their inertia, Newton's first law. Forces are vectors, so directions are important. If something points up, it's positive. If something points down, it's negative. If something points right, it's positive. If something points left, it's negative. So we can add another force in here. We'll call it force one. Same magnitude. If it's going in the same direction as force two, then these forces add together. But if force one goes in the opposite direction of force two, then they subtract. So the total force on the ball on the left is going to be like double either one of those forces, also upwards, because forces add together in this case. But since they're going in opposite directions, they have equal magnitudes on the right-hand ball, the total force equals zero, the net force equals zero. So the net force is going to be zero newtons. You're going to see this a lot, net force. It's from math class, the sigma net force. So recall Newton's third law for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. There's Sir Isaac Newton and there's Mr. Albert Einstein. They're both in wagons because that's what scientists like to do, play in wagons. And they both exert a force on each other. So the force on Newton by Einstein equals the force on Einstein by Newton because of equal and opposite. Now we're going to talk about friction. The person pushes on the box, so we draw an arrow, the force on the box by the person. It's equal to the force on the person by the box. There's also a force on the floor by the box and a force of the box by the floor. So what kind of motion is created by unbalanced net forces? So unbalanced means the net force does not equal zero. We know from Newton's second law that it must be mass times acceleration equals the net force. So what kind of motion is created by an unbalanced net force? Ding, ding, ding. Acceleration. Forces cause acceleration, or accelerations are caused by forces. Forces don't cause the mass. They cause the acceleration. So it's the sum of all the forces that determines the type of motion. So we add all this stuff up. If the net force is zero, then it's not going to accelerate. If it's greater than zero, it's going to accelerate. If it's less than zero, uh, it's not going to move anywhere either. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we discuss friction, but more in detail. So friction is due to the surface. So we can magnify the contact between the box and the floor. Here's a little magnification of this little chunk right here. You can see that you know it's not very smooth. So when things aren't smooth and they rub past each other, it creates friction. So corrugations in the surface grind when things slide. So that's why people use oil. That's why you have oil in your car, because it fills in all these little gaps unless things move smoothly past each other. So why doesn't gravity make the box fall? We've talked about this before. Because there's a force of the Earth acting on the box, pulling it down. The force of the Earth is called weight, the force of gravity. But there's also a force of the floor acting on the box, pushing it back up. So the force from the floor on the box and gravity equals the net force of zero. So if the floor vanished, what do you think is going to happen to the box? It's going to fall because there's no force pushing the box up anymore. So on this diagram, there's some forces that are not shown. Can you name them? The normal force, 
and the force of gravity. Normal force, remember, points straight up, normal force. Force of gravity acts straight down, force of gravity. So when we drew the box on the floor with the normal force and the force of gravity, these weren't strictly force pairs. Because the forces on the box, the result in net force, zero acceleration of the box. That's kind of confusing. So the real pairs have to involve the Earth. Here's an Earth. And we're going to draw some force pairs in here. So the force pairs on this case are the Earth box force pairs. These guys equal, their net force equals zero. The box floor are force pairs. They equal zero. That's what force pairs are. Pairs of forces that net force adds up to zero. You can also draw, where's he at? There is a satellite coming in. If we have a satellite force pair between the Earth and the satellite, notice how these are the same magnitude but in opposite directions. That means their net force is going to be zero. The question is, does friction always exert a force that tends to bring things to a halt? No. There could be things like air resistance. Air resistance, you know, here's a piece of paper. It's falling. Force of gravity going this way. And a little bit of air resistance going up. Force of the air. These things are going to have to zero, so it's going to keep falling. It's going to fall slowly, but it's going to still keep falling. Because technically, air resistance is a frictional force. So what does this say about the direction of frictional forces relative to the velocity vector? So if the velocity vector is this way, so the velocity vector is that way, which direction does the frictional force point? It's opposite of the direction of motion. So if I have a velocity going this way, velocity, friction is going to be going this way. Friction. If I have velocity going this way, friction is going to be going this way, and so on and so forth. So what do you think would happen if we loaded lead bricks into the box? Would it become harder to slide? You betcha. So things with more weights are going to be harder to slide. And that's because of our equation for frictional force, which I will tell you in just one minute. So what are some ways to reduce frictional forces? We can lubricate it. We can change the type of surface we're sliding it across. And we can reduce the normal force. So this heavier box leads to a heavier normal force. So the lower the normal force, the lower the friction. The higher the normal force, higher the friction. And I bet you any money that that's going to be in our equation for frictional forces. All right, so there's two types of forces that we are concerned with, static and kinetic, which means dynamic friction. So static frictional forces when nothing is sliding. Static means still, still means static. Kinetic frictional forces when surfaces are sliding, when their stuff is moving. It's two different types of frictional forces, one when it's sitting still, one when it's moving. Static frictional forces are always greater, always greater than kinetic ones. So if I have a box sitting here, it's going to take more force to get it to move initially than it is to keep it moving. It's because I'll show you the equations for friction. So the force of friction equals this weird little Greek letter mu. And depending on what type of friction we're talking about, you can have an S or a K here. I bet you can figure out that this S means static. If we had a K here, it means kinetic. So the force of friction equals mu sub S times the normal force. So this static coefficient here is always bigger than the kinetic one. So if I have a box here, let's say it weighs 10 kilograms, or has a mass, sorry, I shouldn't say weight because that'd be wrong. And the coefficient, let me make a little more room here. Box, 10 kgs, coefficient, static friction between the box and the floor is 0 0.4. No units on these, there's no units on the coefficient. And I push on this guy with a force of, let's say, three newtons. Okay, how much frictional force is going to be? Static frictional force. 
equals question mark. Sometimes you'll see me write it as a lowercase f, which means friction with the subscript for static. So let's see, here's our equation again. Mu sub s, f sub n. So to find this, we need to find f sub n. And remember, force normal, they have weight going down, normal force going up. So the normal force equals weight, which equals mass times gravity. So we have mu sub s times m times g. So we plug in our numbers, 0 0.4, mass is 10. Gravity, I'm using blackboard gravity is 10. So we get 100 times 0.4, so we get 40 newtons. So that means I'm going to have to push on this box with 40 newtons in order to get it to move. Well, more than 40. So the frictional force of static is less than, or sorry, greater than, I'm messing up again, let me erase that. So the force that we need to push on this box to get it to move has to be greater, force applied has to be greater than 40 newtons. So I push on this with 3 newtons, it's not going to move anywhere. I push on it with 30 newtons, it's not going to move anywhere. I push on it with 39.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
So we're always neglecting air resistance in physics. Like most of your problems say neglect air resistance or ignore the you know, effects of air on this object because it can be really difficult to deal with. It's some ridiculous equations that I never even used until like my senior year of college. But it does affect projectile motion in the real world. Luckily we're in physics class and not the real world. So friction forces opposes friction force opposes velocity through medium, which means like through air in this case. It imposes a horizontal force, so it, you have to add another vector in there. And we're also talking about terminal velocity for falling objects. Terminal velocity is achieved because of air resistance. So dominant energy drain on cars, bicyclists, and planes. So that's why we want our cars to be aerodynamic to reduce that air resistance. That's why we want planes to be aerodynamic. And it even uh, affects bicycles because the faster you move, the more air resistance there is. And some of those bicyclists, like in the, in the Olympics, Olympics and stuff, like they have like these weird shaped helmets. They're kind of like this. They look really corny, but they help reduce the air resistance, just like this ball over here. The air just kind of flows over it. So air resistance is an upward force exerted on an object as it falls through the air. It is, in essence, a frictional force, because a frictional force is any force that opposes motion. And if air, resource, air resistance acts against the velocity, then it must be a frictional force as well. For simplicity, the amount of air resistance is determined by two factors. The cross-sectional area of the object, like how much surface area is like smacking into that air, and the speed of an object. So the more cross-sectional area, the greater the force. And the faster something goes, also the greater the air resistance. You can see this from that little demo we did the very first day of class with that coffee filter. Uh, coffee filter, before we crumpled it up, had a much larger cross-sectional area than if we did if we crumpled it. That's why it kind of floated down instead of like when we crumpled it up, it just fell straight and at the same time as a tennis ball. So we're going to try to find real quick a couple of the terminal velocities of this 85 kilogram skydiver at points A and D. So first, he jumps out of his little helicopter thingy here. Force of gravity equals 833 newtons. No air resistance because his velocity is zero. So what is his acceleration here? So force equals ma, a equals f over m. So a is going to be 8. 33 divided by 85. And guess what? You're going to get 9.8 meters per second squared, which is gravity, which makes sense because it's the only thing pulling them down. Now, what if there's 350 newtons of air resistance acting against this guy? So now, I need to get in the habit of drawing that little net force on there. So acceleration again, it's net force divided by the mass. Acceleration, net force is going to be 833 minus 350 divided by the mass. And you're going to see that he's accelerating slower than he was before. Now all the way up here, we do the same thing. Acceleration is going to be the net force divided by the mass. So 833 minus 700 is 133 newtons divided by his mass. And we get an acceleration of 1.56 meters per second squared. Now in this case, 833 up, 833 down, net force is zero. Acceleration equals zero over 85. Acceleration equals zero. It is at this point that he reaches terminal velocity. He's still falling, he still has a velocity, it's just not getting any bigger because the acceleration is now zero. Uh, just real quick, how we get these, we have force and mass, and newtons divided by kilograms, how the heck do we end up at meters per second squared? So recall that a newton equals a kilogram times a meter over second squared. So if I'm doing newtons divided by kilograms, the same thing as kilograms times meters over second squared divided by kilograms, those kilograms are canceled out and I'm left with meters per second squared, which is good because I'm talking about acceleration. So the terminal velocity of a skydiver in free fall position with a semi-closed parachute is about 195 kilometers per hour, which is pretty darn fast. 
higher speeds can be attained if a skydiver pulls his uh, pulls in his limbs. I'm sure you like watch James Bond. He jumps out of his airplane. He tries to catch the falling woman who jumps was pushed out of the airplane or something. So in this case, you can actually increase your terminal velocity to about 320 kilometers per hour. Also, really freaking fast. So the more compact and dense the object, the higher its terminal velocity be. That's why James Bond tucks in his arms so he can fly faster. That's why Batman, I'm sure he did that in one of his movies, tucks in his arms so he can catch, you know, Vicky Vale or whoever his love interest is in that movie. So typical examples are the following. Raindrops fall about 25 feet per second. Skydiver was found to be in the range about 174 feet per second, about 259 feet, 249 feet per second. So here's Mr. Skydiver. So at the start of his jump, the air resistance is zero. So he accelerates downwards. He's falling a little more. So as his speed increases, his air resistance will also increase. Eventually, though, he'll be going so fast and his air resistance will be big enough to balance the skydiver's weights. At this point, the forces are balanced, so his speed becomes constant, not zero. Do not write zero, put constant. And this is called terminal velocity, when the upward force equals the downward force, when the air resistance equals the force of gravity. So how the forces change with time, you can see this guy, he's falling. You can see the blue arrow getting taller and taller and taller. At the same time, the net force gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that point right there, his air resistance equals the force of gravity, and his net force was zero. So when a skydiver opens his parachute, the air resistance suddenly increases a lot, causing him to start to slow down. His acceleration now will be that way because his velocity is this way. He starts to slow down. Because he's slowing down, his air resistance will decrease until it balances his weight again. The skydiver has now reached a new lower terminal velocity. He's going to slow down, but eventually the upward force is going to equal the lower force again. But this time his velocity is going to be a lot smaller. That's why you know, skydivers don't die and hit the ground. All right, why that happens is more air resistance because a lot bigger surface area. There's a lot more surface area created because of his parachute, so the air resistance is more. And if we graph this guy, it might look something like this. You can see he jumps out of the plane right here. The speed increases, the speed increases, the speed increases until it reaches this flat point. Velocity remains or starts to be constant, and this is where terminal velocity is reached. All right, now he opens his parachute right there, and velocity starts to decrease until it starts to flatten out again. He's reached his new terminal velocity. And this is where he hits the ground. Velocity just drops to zero pretty quick. Now on the moon, this wouldn't look like this. His speed would just increase and increase and increase and increase and increase forever because there's no air. So it creates no air resistance, so he never slows down. So even if he opens a parachute, it's not going to do anything. Like, he's just still going to speed up. Luckily, though, gravity is a lot smaller on the moon, so he doesn't quite reach, you know, the same speeds he would on Earth. So to wrap up, every force has an equal and opposing force. Friction opposes motion, requiring continued application of force to maintain a constant velocity. Air resistance produces terminal velocity, which alters trajectories of projectiles for the worse, usually. Thank you.